Welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Park. Tonight, we're going to talk about something I don't normally talk much about, which is the area of supplements, herbs, spices, botanicals, and vitamins. Essentially, natural substances that we take for granted uh, to stay healthy prophylactically and not wait until we're sick. There are too many things I can talk about, but for tonight, I'm gonna to reveal to you three natural non-prescription-based items Two that you, two that you already, may, already, sorry, already may be familiar with and one that you may not be. And there'll be plenty of time for live Q&A at the end. And later on, if you have a question, please place it in the Q&A area, not in the chat section. But before we begin, I want to remind you that the content and opinion in this webinar is not to be taken as medical advice. Please talk with your doctor before making any changes to your health regimen. And no, I'm not going to try to sell you any vitamins or supplements now or in the future. So what does it mean to be healthy? In the old days and still in most traditional cultures, you maintain health by eating healthy ingredients, staying active and minimizing stress, which also includes not overworking, good social support structures and safety nets. And we use technology to help us not control us. Unfortunately, modern medicine's concept of health is somewhat warped. There's a running joke that the definition of high cholesterol is a Lipitor deficiency. Rather than eating and living a lifestyle that's conducive for health and wellness, rather we rely on medications to address our countless chronic diseases, which is ultimately making, uh, making everyone sicker, fatter, and unhappier. Now we all know intuitively what it takes to be healthy. You need to sleep well, and make it a priority. Um, you have to have good breathing in general, especially at night. You have to eat healthy, get lots of sun exposure, regular exercise, uh, and good prenatal care, especially um, if you're having a baby, um, and focus on sleep, good sleep, uh, relaxation, and stress reduction. And if you have insomnia or any of these sleep breathing disorders, such as sleep apnea or UIRS, then you have to get dental care, braces, appliances, and sleep apnea treatment. But there's one more thing, which is through supplements, whether through herbs, spices, botanicals, or vitamins. Now in the Merriman Webster dictionary, the definition of health is the condition of being well or free from disease. So if you take this literally, that means that since we all have billions of dangerous viruses and bacteria inside our bodies, we're not healthy. Here's another definition by the World Health Organization a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence or disease or infirmity. It's getting a bit closer, but not quite enough. Still in the black and white mentality, either you have it or you don't. Now, this is Dr. Andrew Weil. He's a very noted uh, integrative uh, health practitioner. He passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, his definition is uh, health is something that he considers a relative state of wholeness and balance. And here are some, a few other of his quotes. It's an, an inner resilience that allows you to meet the demands of living without being overwhelmed. An internal springness that allows you to move through the world and not get hurt, even if you come in contact with germs, allergies, or toxins. Balance of all internal and external forces. And lastly, don't use fear as a motivator to start being healthy. Fear eventually subsides and so does motivation. So one good example is if you fall, happen to fall down, if you become really rigid and you're not flexible, the more likely you're gonna break something. But if you become limp and roll as you fall, the less likely you're gonna get hurt. And the same concept applies with being well and, and healthy. So this chart up here, I kind of think about um, where we are right now in modern healthcare, which is health, this definition of health. And also as you progress to the right, it's, it's wellness. And so the traditional health is thought of as something that's static, fixed, uh, reactive, responsive, inflexible, rigid, and fragile. Whereas on the other side, if you're well, that's a very active form of being, adjusting, constantly preempting, preventing, being flexible, and being adaptive, and being resilient. So health on the left is a static noun, so to speak, and wellness is an action verb it's a lifestyle or state of mind. So why is an ENT sleep surgeon talking about wellness, nutritional supplements, or healthy ingredients? 
And there are three reasons I'm doing this webinar. I commented a few weeks ago that my severe spring and fall allergies are completely gone since I've been taking various supplements, especially vitamin D. A lot of people inquired about that. Modern medicine is, is extremely skeptical about vitamins and supplements, despite tomes of research that shows otherwise. I used to believe that there was, a, there was no value in supplements or vitamins, but I've done a complete 180 degrees on this. And more recently, what got me really upset is the fact that the, the government agencies such as the CDC and FDA, as well as the World Health Organization, completely dismiss and even actively discourage the use of any natural or non-prescription remedies or prophylaxis or treatment of COVID-19 infections. They've even discouraged and downplayed any existing generic medications for treatment as well. And again, despite lots of positive data. There are so many different supplements to go over, but we only have time for three this evening. I encourage you to be more open-minded and do your own research from sources that are not heavily influenced by big pharma, such as WebMD, mainstream media, which includes print and TV, and even the CDC and FDA. Now, you may be, think, you may be shocked that I said the FDA and CDC, because even the AMA and all the major medical specialties and academies, and many of the, of the patient advocacy groups, such as the American Diabetes, Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association, are heavily influenced by industry. Uh, this involves major funding as well as board, of, board member appointments. But before I get into the specific supplements, I need to summarize why our country's healthcare system is in the mess that it is, and also to put everything into context. An important piece of history that you must know about is how healthcare was transformed in the early 1900s, single-handedly by John D. Rockefeller. I came across this book written by Dr. Um, e. Richard Brown in the late 70s, who is a sociologist from UCLA, who based much of his research on Abraham Flexner's autobiography, who was commissioned by the Carnegie Foundation and the AMA, who contributed heavily to writing the report. Flexner's brother, Simon, headed up Rockefeller's General Education Fund. And Rockefeller, using all his influence and money, transformed American healthcare into a fully allopathic system, pushing out all other alternative practitioners. They upheld Johns Hopkins's uh, German model of research and teaching, which all the others followed. As a result, over half the medical schools in the US were closed. And also one of the casualties were that uh, five out of seven black medical colleges ended up closing as well. And of note, the AMA later apologized for this. Essentially Rockefeller and the AMA took over medicine in the United States. And since then, the main focus for American healthcare is pharmaceuticals. They pushed out what were called the eclectics, which are the botanical and herbal medicine fields, holistic and naturopathy as well. The few that survived had to conform to the AMA recommendations. And this is why proper nutrition is not taught in medical schools unless it's about enteral, which is oral, or parenteral IV nutrition after surgery. Nothing about eating a healthy diet to avoid diseases. In medical school, sleep only gets about 30 to 60 minutes in teaching curriculums. I actually inquired about incorporating more topics about sleep with our medical school administrators, and they told me that they have too many other important topics to cover. Now, if you start reading more about this, some authors have even called the US healthcare model a cartel. I encourage all of you to read more about this, and if you have time, read the Rockefeller Medicine Man book. It's a very eye-opening book. Now, with that perspective in mind, let's talk about supplements and vitamins. With the onset of or uh, information overload on the internet. And if you can't trust the mainstream medical establishments, and since your doctor can't or won't tell you since he doesn't know, how do you find the right information? Being of Korean descent, I grew up with the fundamental understanding of Chinese medicine since my grandfather was in this field. My wife and I still ascribe to the saying that food is medicine. During my medical education process, the validity and usefulness of Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and naturopathic or any other alternative complementary areas were severely suppressed, if not denig denigrated. Now, let me give you a personal example of my father-in-law. Uh, when we were first, my wife and I were first married, he got diagnosed with advanced stage four stomach cancer. And uh, basically he, did, he had a very poor prognosis. So they went in to do salvage surgery. They, they took out most of his stomach and um, had planned on doing exploratory laparotomy, but they had to close up because the cancer had spread all throughout his, his uh, abdomen. So basically they gave him three to six months to live. Um, they recommended chemotherapy or radiation, but he refused that. So my mother-in-law just 
opened up her uh, cookbooks and just whipped up all these traditional Korean and Chinese uh, recipes. And lo and behold, um, he, she got him back to health and he lived for 10 years until he got into another stressful situation that the cancer returned. So if you ask this doctor, is there anything natural you can do to lower your high blood pressure? What's his response? Besides losing weight and eating a low salt diet, most likely he'll recommend a high blood pressure pill. When I was practicing, I saw a lot of people complaining of nasal congestion after being placed on the medication for high blood pressure. This is because many of these classes of medications lower sympathetic tone. So the blood vessels relax, not only lowering your blood pressure, but also congesting your nose. So what happens to these people who have untreated nasal congestion? In the spirit of the classic children's book, if you give a pig a pancake, let me tell you a story. If you give Peter a pressure pill, he'll notice the stuffy nose that goes with it. You'll give him nasal sprays and medications, which doesn't work because he has no allergy conditions. Then he starts to sleep with his mouth open agape and snores louder and louder, keeping his wife awake. He starts to become heavier and heavier and his blood pressure becomes higher and higher. Then he starts to wake up many times at night to pee. You'll probably offer him another pill to take gleefully. This causes him to go limp in bed and his wife shows him a lot of sympathy. Then he sees a urologist asking for Viagra, but is refused because of the risk for high blood pressure sequela. Peter is offered a penile implant instead, which he refuses by saying, I'd rather be dead. He's also given Flomax for his enlarged prostate. Now he pees less at night, which he thinks is great. His wife now can't sleep because of Peter's snoring. Go to the sleep doctor now, she yells at him, threatening. At last, he was found to have severe obstructive sleep apnea. And after starting CPAP, the mask triggered his claustrophobia. But now after using CPAP for a few months, he can think clearly now whenever he wants. His sex life is also much improved. Thank God the penile implant he refused. He can sleep through the night without peeing on the right track. He begins to lose weight and no more evidence of having snack. His blood pressure is now much better and offers medications forever. He's back to his normal weight. Peter is feeling great and able to think straight. The end. So most likely, if Peter was sleeping better, he and his wife were happy again. This is one of many of the unintended consequences of prescribing a common and benign medication without looking at the patient's life history and sleep habits. Fortunately, this one had a happy ending. Another unintended consequence that we see in sleep medicine is weight gain when using CPAP. On, av on average, overall, it's, it's a small amount, but it's significant. In some people, it can be severe. And there are some studies suggesting that even tonsillectomy in children also has a risk of weight gain about 0.5 to 2 pounds. Now, this is just a small scattering of supplements, vitamins, and other products that have proven health properties. But tonight, I'm going to focus on just three, vitamin D, turmeric, and black seed, or black cumin seed. Now, vitamin D is actually a hormone, not a vitamin. And sunlight converts the vitamin D precursor in the skin into the active form. And it has strong anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, and anti-cancer effects. Uh, for a good review of the benefits of vitamin D, take a look at my interview with Dr. Stasia Gomenak on vitamin D, which is one of the more popular interviews on my podcast. There's a good two-part review of the current status of vitamin D with COVID by Dr. John Campbell, the British physician, um, that you can find on YouTube. And just to give you a heads up about optimal levels, 30 milligrams is the low level of normal to prevent rickets and bony deformities. And from all the population studies and what Dr. Gomenak proposes, you need to be at, at between 50 and 70 to see any health benefits. It's also important to note that you need a, need a level of at least 40 for your gut to absorb calcium. Not too surprisingly, the average level in the US is under 30, around 28. Overall, 40% is under 20 and 82% of Blacks and 70% of Hispanics. And this is because of darker skin pigmentation. So there are also uh, lots of population studies showing worsening health outcomes in people moving from the equatorial areas up north or south. 
One of the unintended consequences of staying out of the sun for fear of skin cancer is that despite skin cancer rates dropped, all other cancers overall increased. And here are a few examples of the power of vitamin D. Among thousands of studies supporting its use, including benefits for your immune system, weight loss, high blood pressure, depression, certain cancers, bone health, diabetes, oral health, heart disease, and what I'm gonna talk about, its protective effect for respiratory infections. I encourage you to look into these, some of this uh, more when you have time. I guarantee that you'll go down a rabbit hole. Um, so this is a, a study from Germany, which is a meta-analysis. And of note, the average vitamin D level was 23, and they controlled for age, uh, comorbid factors. This is the vitamin D level from zero to 50. This is the mortality coefficient, so how severe the uh, people died. And red dots are all the hospital large studies, and there's another population study by Dr. Ahmed, the blue dots, and the, 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 the correlation kind of lines go this way, but the uh, green line, the combined data, goes right down the middle. And notice how at around 50, the mortality rates go, go to near zero. So obviously this is a very um, theoretical modeling exercise, but it just kind of goes to show that the lower the uh, vitamin D, the higher the risk of complications and death. And there, there's been countless studies um, about COVID on this so far. And then this was a, a vitamin D supplementation to prevent acute respiratory tract infections um, this is not COVID, but past infections, uh, whether it's uh, SARS or influenza or any other kind of upper respiratory infection. They looked at almost 11,000 patients. And this is a very high grade criteria, meaning grade is the, uh, the type of system that they use to um, uh, determine how good the data is in terms of the, the evidence based on the um, meta-analysis, which is where they combine multiple studies together. And this is what's called a forest plot here. And the black side line means is one, means there's, there's a ratio of one to one being uh, basically no effect. And then if you go to the positive numbers, that means there's increased risk. And if you can do a negative, there's decreased risk. So if you look at the average here, this dotted line, and the biome is the average here, this uh, rhomboid figure, notice how it, the, the, the range goes from um, like point, point 0.1, maybe to point 0.3 and it doesn't touch the one line, that means it's statistically significant. There's no chance that it was just by chance. And this is a large population cord study. And what they found was that people given vitamin D supplementation had very slight overall protection, the hazard ratio of 0.95, so like a 5% like a uh, improvement, which is very small, but, very, but still significant. However, if their vitamin D levels were over 30, they had much lower rates of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, severe infection mortality. So the hazard ratio was 0.66, that's pretty significant. So this is just vitamin D levels, what they came in with. Now let's go into one of the uh, two, two other spices and you recognize one and maybe not the other one. The first one is turmeric, which is actually a root in the ginger family. And it's a category of polyphenols. And there are countless studies and reviews on the health benefits of curcumin, which is the main ingredient in, in turmeric. The major active ingredient uh, in turmeric is a polyphenol. And actually, I'm going to pronounce the, uh, the chemical name. Just bear with me here. It's 1,7-bis-4-hydroxy-3-methoxyphenol-1,6-heptadiene-3,5-dione. It's, it's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, this has documented significant antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. It's found to help with arthritis various eye conditions, metabolic syndrome, kidney health, cognition, uh, lowers cholesterol, lowers amyloid plaques in the brain and helps with pain. It also possibly improves memory, increases uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And other studies on the potential benefit uh, exist for kidney health, eye health, pain, and even IBS. And most of these benefits are due to Kirkman's anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. And one of the problems with Kirkman is that it's very difficult to absorb but it's been found that if you take it with black pepper, which it has the ingredient pepperine, piperine, it increases curcumin absorption by 2000%. And here's one study I found looking at using curcumin for SARS-CoV-2. So it's kind of a uh, long conclusion, but the results say that patients with mild, moderate, severe symptoms receive curcumin, piperine, 
treatment showed that early symptomatic recovery, including fever, cough, sore throat, breathlessness, they had less deterioration, fewer red flag signs, better ability to maintain oxygen saturation above 94%, and better clinical outcomes for the patients on the control group. And furthermore, the um, curcumin preparin treatment appeared to reduce the duration of hospitalization in patients with moderate to severe symptoms, and fewer deaths were observed in the curcumin preparin uh, treatment group. So this is a very small study, um, 70 in the control, 70 in the uh, treatment arm, um, and they kind of split these up into three different groups. So the numbers in each category were kind of small. And fortunately, they didn't really present their raw data in a very graphical format like most of the studies. So it was really hard to interpret the statistical analysis. But you get the idea that um, all these smaller studies, they, they help all have very uh, pretty dramatically profound effects uh, j just for an, an herb or a uh, spice or, or um, supplement. Now, you'll also notice that all these studies um, using natural substances come from not the US or, or anywhere in Europe, but in the Middle East or India. And this is where they have strong natural healing traditions. Uh, plus, they don't have the resources to purchase all enough vaccines and all the high-tech uh, ways of treating COVID. Now, black cumin seed, uh, this is different than regular cumin. It's a totally different plant. Um, this is um, otherwise known as black seed or black cumin seed, or the scientific name is Nigella savita. Now, you also may see it in its oil form. It's in the buttercup family of flowering plants. I actually came across this through YouTube's Dr. Mobin Syed's medical lectures, who cited this study from Pakistan. He said that his mother made him eat a pinch of it every day when he was growing up in Pakistan for its health benefits. They had a lot of interesting results, but I'm going to highlight only a few of their findings. This was a multi-center, prospective, randomized, placebo-controlled trial using black seed and regular honey. And there are tons of studies about the benefits of honey, so that's why they decided to combine it together. And they gave them uh, one gram of honey and 80 milligrams per kilogram per day in three doses for 13 days versus placebos. And what they found is quite remarkable. They enrolled over 300 patients and reported the results in the um, separately in the uh, moderate and severe cases. The moderate had 100 in the uh, treatment, 100 in placebo, and severe 1550. So this is the graph of uh, mod the moderate cases, and these are the severe cases. And on both uh, categories, so control is blue and red is the treatment. And so as the time goes on, this is um, improvement, 100% improvement here. So notice how the, the, the people who got the uh, black seed and honey uh, recovered much faster in the moderate, and even in the severe, not as well, not as high as 100%, but much quicker. And the same for these other measures. This is, a, I think this is a positivity of COVID testing. So in both arms, in both uh, categories, moderate or severe, they uh, actually improved four days earlier. So six day, day six versus day 10 in moderate and day 8.5 versus 12 was severe. In the severe patients, only 4% uh, died when given treatment versus 18.8% in the control group, which is a four times lower rate of death. Now they also compared against historical uh, mortality data against um, the, the, uh, using various medications against uh, SARS-CoV-2, including steroids um, and of course, and look up here, you have a 4% death with black seed and honey. Uh, with steroids, it's 25%, remdesivir, 11%, hydroxychloroquine, 27%, convalescent plasma, 16%, lopinavir, ritinavir, I don't think we use that in the US, 19%, uh, whereas the uh, black seed and honey was a 4% death rate. Now, unfortunately, this is still caught up in peer review, so it's not published yet. Um, it's been in peer review for almost a year, I'm sure they're probably um, just going to other journals. Um, unfortunately, results like this are unlikely to get accepted to, in any of the major mainstream journals uh, just because of its um, profound ramifications. And as I searched for other studies on black seed, I found lots of other studies supporting its health benefits. It's, it's pretty endless. There's another study looking at um, 376 patients, about half were given black seed. Um, and outcomes were clinical infection, fever, dry, protective cough, wheezing, headache, chest tightness, difficulty with exertion, shortness of breath, sore throat, malaise, and diarrhea. Unfortunately, this is a test where they did not use PCR testing. Um, so it just went by clinical symptoms. And of the 376 patients, 
66% of two thirds got infected. And when they were um, put into these um, treatment versus placebo arms, again, the people who got the black seed um, did much, much better than, than the, um, the uh, placebo. So if you look at this graph here of the infected people, um, these are the controls and these are the, uh, the uh, black seed group. So much less patient count. Um, if you're not infected, the um, treatment group, the black seed treatment was much higher, a big difference. So whether you're infected or not infected, there was a big difference. Um, and the p-value, which is the um, degree of significance, was, it was very significant at 0 0.001. So again, despite the criticism that they didn't use um, PCR data, um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty good study. Now, um, they cite thymoquinone as the main ingredient in um, black seed. And, and you'll see that they're, they, have, they have other ingredients besides thymoquinone, which is the main prominent ingredient. But black seed also has vitamin C, zinc, quercetin, nejaledin, and hederin. And all of these combined have antibacterial, antiviral, anti-cancer, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory factors, uh, properties, and it's also an immune modulator. So they cite that um, thymoquinone as a possible blocking agent for the ACE2 receptor. And obviously that has implications with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. So there, there are studies showing that it has antibacterial properties against strep aurea, pseudomonas, helicobacter pylori, which is the one for um, um, stomach ulcers, and E. coli. It has been found to be effective against SARS-CoV-2 ACE receptor and many other respiratory viruses. It also improves lung function based on pulmonary function testing and respiratory symptoms. It also has anti-cancer properties, um, cancer cell viability diminishes, lowers proliferation, and increases cancer cell death. It's also an antioxidant by acting as a radical scavenger and also anti-inflammatory properties because it lowers uh, cyclooxygenase and 5-lipooxygenase. So these are very technical terms, but you get the idea that it's a very, there's some uh, pretty wide range of studies uh, showing that it does have significant effects with all these properties. And also it modulates your immune system. So it actually improves your levels of interleukin 1, 6, 8, 10, uh, tumor necrosis factor, nuclear factor kappa B, you know, so lowers your interferon levels. So these are all num names and um, uh, molecules that you're going to read about in immunology and cancer research and inflammation. All right, and this is just a review article about the usefulness, the potential usefulness of thymoquinolone. All right, now let's go to the question. So just for the future, um, the question should be put in the Q&A section and not the chat. Um, so many of you are asking, there, would there be a replay? And absolutely, I'd definitely send you a replay of this. All right, let me ask, answer two. Bella asks, what do you recommend for people who already have had skin cancer and have a strong family history of skin cancer? Dermatologists don't want these people to get in the sun, but how can they vitamin D and its benefits? Um, so in your case, just get, take vitamin D. Um, but the, doc, the level of vitamin D that most doctors would give you is, is actually way too low. Um, they'll try to get you above the 30, which is the bare minimum to prevent rickets. And remember that study that um, the meta-analysis showed that you have to be above 50. And I, I strongly recommend you go listen to Dr. Gomenak's uh, interview. If you search look up vitamin D on my website, drsimpark.com, you'll find her interviews. Um, and she has strong evidence um, showing that you have to be between 50 and 70 to get all the benefits of you know, lower rates of heart disease, diabetes, suicide, cancer, those kind of things. Uh, Marcia asks, is there any concern for potential heartburn issues with taking turmeric or curcumin? I'm very sensitive to anything spicy and will often trigger bad heartburn, so I've been reluctant to take them even though they have good medical properties. Same question for black seed. Well, they, they can actually, um, you can actually find these main ingredients in, in tablet or pill form. So that should be much, much better than just eating raw, raw spices. Um, but you know, there are other spices or other foods um, besides turmeric and black seed that have uh, these healthy natural ingredients. So just do your research and just take some alternatives. Okay. Now, let me go into the question that, that came in. Uh, Millicent asks, what supplements are good for vision health? Um, I think I mentioned that uh, black seed was found to help with vision health. Um, 
historically vitamin A is, is what's uh, promoted to, for, uh, for vision health, but anything that's anti-inflammatory or addresses insulin resistance, uh, such as black seed, um, and also you have to treat your sleep apnea because that causes major inflammation as well. Um, so there's no one magic bullet for eye health. Um, it's treating everything, your sleep, your diet, your lifestyle, um, your stress factors. Um, so yeah, so unfortunately our, our main gut reaction to, is to ask what's the number one best thing. And unfortunately there's no best for, for anything because I mean, despite the fact that curcumin um, and, and black seed um, have all these potentially amazing results, um, obviously you're not gonna you know, eat spoonfuls of that every day. Um, and typically you can eat it in, in the foods and in, in the traditional cultures, they eat a lot more obviously. Um, but if you do your research, you're gonna find other foods or spices um, that you may even normally eat or like eating that have nutritious uh, ingredients such as um, turmeric or um, a property such as for turmeric. Uh, Dale asks, are there any particular foods or supplements to avoid before bedtime to reduce apnea episodes? I know a lot of avoiding alcohol, but I noticed that eating carbs in your bedtime seems to make my apnea worse. Uh, my answer to you, Dale, is just don't eat anything because anything that creates more stomach acid is going to come up when you stop breathing, causing more inflammation in the throat. Um, so I know it, it's very challenging for some people, um, but if you start to sleep better, in theory, the hunger pains do get better. Uh, Rocky asks, any insights on what supplements or nutrients block GLUT5? I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. I mean, there's so many different uh, chemicals and biomedical, bio, biological processes that um, are involved with health and wellness. So I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, Rick asks, what is the optimum vitamin E level in a blood test? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not aware of that offhand. Um, and also the blood tests, you have to take with a grain of salt. Um, not all, but in some blood tests, for example, thyroid levels, um, you could be relatively normal in the lower range, but you could be functionally hypothyroid. Um, so you have to look at your clinical features and not just the blood test numbers. So for example, and, it's, and the same thing for vitamin D too. Uh, Rick asks again, black cumin with honey, how much of each? Well, unfortunately, what they did was they combined the two together. And ideally, they should have just maybe just done the black seed by itself. When you combine two things, you don't know what the effect is. I think they just they thought it was cheap and they had it available. So they just kind of gave it to them and it sounded like they got a pretty good result. Um, you know, I'm going to actually send everyone some of the um, links to the uh, research studies that and the black seed study. Um, with the doses, the amounts for the black seed and also the honey. So M says, I believe my CPAP is causing more problems, including dry eye, claustrophobia, frustration, so that weight is still an issue. What about orthodontics to expand jaw? So, you know, without examining you, I can't tell you what options you have, but in general, um, you have to expand, you have to exhaust all your um, CPAP troubleshooting steps. So obviously work with your uh, sleep doctor and, and the sleep lab. Um, there are lots of good, also a lot of good online resources uh, like cpaptalk.com and the number of fantastic uh, YouTube, um, YouTubers um, with uh, by respiratory technicians with CPAP problems. Can you provide your feedback on Nick Little Hill's work on sleep? His book, Sleep, he speaks to a poly versus monophase approach to sleep. Um, I, I think I vaguely understand what he's talking about. Maybe um, taking multiple periods of sleep, like what an infant does. But typically, if you look at the um, sleep, sleep the, tra the tradition, sorry, the transition of sleep from infant to an adult, it tends to consolidate. So an infant, when uh, infants are born, they, have, they sleep multiple times throughout the night, throughout the day and night, and slowly it just consolidates into uh, nighttime sleep only at the time they're about you know, two or three. So, um, and I think, there, there are different proposals for different ways of sleeping and uh, including maybe integrating naps in, in, the, in the middle of the day if possible, which is found to be very healthy. Um, and maybe that could be a mini version of what he's talking about. So without having read this book, I'm not quite sure how to answer you, so sorry. Rocky, have you tried marshmallow root to soothe the burn of curcumin? 
yeah, um, I guess this would answer um, just someone else that, that asked about the heartburn. Yeah, so the, the uh, marsh, marshmallow root could help or take uh, the supplements as opposed to just eating the spice. Uh, Steve said, you said BP meds can cause nasal congestion. That would explain a lot of things. I take amylopidine and lisinopril and often nasal congestion and nothing seems to help. What can I do? So um, Steve, that's, that's a tough one because I'm not gonna tell you to stop your medications because that's up to you and your, your doctor. Um, one thing that you could try is maybe switch to another kind of a blood pressure medication that, that doesn't have as much congestion issues. If you have sebapnia, that's also another <laughs> reason to have high blood pressure. So um, I don't know whether or not you have it, but if you, if you, if you have been diagnosed, at least get tested for it. Uh, worst case scenario, um, you can go to see an ENT that may be able to offer you nasal surgery. It's not the most ideal situation, um, but that's, that's all we have to, uh, to be able to help you right now. Uh, but it's really important to breathe through your nose for the reasons that I described in my poem. Kevin asks, can you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth? Is this just as effective as in and out through your nose? I think it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing what's called the relaxing breath in yoga, yogic breathing, it's in through your nose, out through your mouth very slowly. Um, so that's the technique that promotes healthy breathing. And there's other variations of these um, healthy breathing techniques. Um, but in general, when you're sitting quietly, you should be breathing in and out through your nose because your nose processes the air. It filters it, warms and humidifies, and um, the nitric oxide also kills bacteria and viruses and funguses. Right? And so it pre-processes the air before you go into your lungs. But also if you breathe out through your mouth, you're also exhaling the humidity, you're drying your mouth too. So you're only getting the, you're actually, you're drying the saliva, which also has beneficial properties too. So ideally you should breathe your nose in and out. And I mentioned before that even mar the elite marathon runners breathe through the nose the whole time during the 26 miles. And um, they're the ones that always win for obvious reasons because breathing through the nose is much healthier and uh, actually gives you more endurance in the long term. Christine asks, what nutritional deficiencies can cause sleep or airway issues in large swollen soft tissues or tongue? Can you comment on the use of natural mast cell stabilizers for dealing with mast cell activation syndrome symptoms like congestion, inflamed swollen nasal turbinates? Thoughts about OTC nasochrome? No, th there isn't any one nutritional supplement or vitamin that's been known to, to cause airway issues, but anything that, that predisposes to causing, causing inflammation. So if your body is more irritable, uh, whether it's in the throat with your lymphoid tissues or in the gut, any kind of chronic irritation will cause inflammation. And when you have inflammation, you're going to have more lymphoid swelling in the throat or the adenoids, and that's going to cause your glands to swell up, causing more obstruction. Um, and then that causes more reflux, causing more obstruction, causing tonsils and nodes to get bigger. Um, and so, and that also causes your nose to run and get more swollen too. I can't say there's any one in general. Obviously, if you're, if you have severe deficiency in one or two, then that, that can cause problems. But most people have just chronic multiple types of deficiency in America um, for the reason that, that I talked about. Uh, the mast cell stabilizers like nasochrome, that's been a very old tried and true medication. It does help with allergies. Um, if, if it works for you, keep using it. But my point is you, you shouldn't have to use a, a synthetic prescription medication. Um, but, and I think I'm hop hoping that you would appreciate and understand that there are lots of natural remedies using food or uh, natural, um, whether you're using uh, spices or um, extracts or oils um, that can help, not to the same degree as prescription medications, obviously, uh, but if you combine four or five different healthy substances that, and then also you um, address your sleep issues, address everything else, then that gets you, can get you to a point where um, not only will you feel better, but in terms of your blood pressure numbers, it could actually lower it as much as a medication, but you'll feel better too. And oftentimes when you um, lower your blood pressure, you don't really feel the benefits. You just, you just see the numbers improving. So again, I'm not saying you should stop the prescription medications. That's not my, my job to say. Um, but ideally, even your doctor would agree that it's better to come off your medications when possible. All right. Rick asks, as a supplement, 
in a pill, what brand do you use or would you use? Supplements vary in quality by brand. You're absolutely right. It's, it's a total maze out there. And there's so many different brands. If you look on Amazon, every one of them have five stars. So it's hard to choose which one to go with. Um, I, I think the best thing is to just go by referral. Maybe your parents or your friends who have tried certain brands. Um, honestly, even within the same brand, you're going to get different results for different people. Um, so you want to go for brands that have a reputation for quality. So purity, um, no infections, um, packaging, um, uh, no contamination, those kind of things. Um, and also for, uh, certain supplements have different formulations. For example, magnesium comes in five or six different formulations and they all have different properties for absorption and side effects. Uh, so that's another thing to look for. Uh, Kevin asks your thoughts on supplement melatonin. Actually, a lot of people are asking about melatonin. So melatonin is the hormone that your body makes it starts to make about two hours before your natural sleep time. Um, and so this is what causes drowsiness. And that's why if you uh, use a computer screen or watch, use a TV, watch a TV before bedtime, it suppresses, the blue light suppresses melatonin and then you wanna sleep, go to sleep later and later. One of the ways of treating insomnia is to give melatonin. But for most people, I'm gonna just guess that most people um, the reason why they, why they can't fall asleep is because of all the spinning lights and TV screens and computers and smartphones that they're using before bedtime. So that's the first thing to get rid of. But also, um, you also have to address what time you get up in the morning. So if you wake up later in the morning, then you won't want to fall asleep until later at night. So that's what's called delayed sleep phase syndrome. And also, if you wake up multiple times throughout the night, you'll get insomnia or you'll be, psychologically, you'll be kind of afraid to go to sleep and get so stressed out because you're not falling asleep. And that's where cognitive behavior therapy comes into play. Um, and so melatonin, and, and a lot of people also use high dose melatonin, which is not found to be not that useful. They've shown that even one to two milligrams a few hours before bedtime, um, it's gonna, it's gonna help. And it does help if you, if you can't fall asleep and you take it, it does take some time for it to work. So ideally, if you wanna go to bed at 10, you take it about two hours before you go to bed. Because that, that's the natural rhythm as it starts to go up. You fall asleep two hours after melatonin goes up. And if I didn't answer your question, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer your questions. So that's it for tonight's program. If you have any uh, questions, you can always email me at drstevenpark.com. Uh, and then visit me on my website at drstevenpark.com. I'm hoping that you read better, see better, and live better. Good night.